October is practically choking on games this year. And here are my breakdown of the top 10 that I want to watch out for. And I think you should as well. What are yours? List them out in the comments. Thumbs up the video if you like it. The first up, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. So Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, it's a first-person shooter game that is going to be released again by Activision and made by Infinity Ward. This is coming right after the 2019 reboot, and it'll be the 19th game in this series. More importantly, there's some big changes here. Several new changes that they've talked about are the advanced AI system in the campaign and the co-op modes, which is something we've needed for a long time. Improved water physics, swimming mechanics, and a reworked vehicle system in the locations that you drive around in. And if you want to get your crazy on, you can lean out the window, climb onto the roof, and hijack other vehicles. Modern Warfare 2 is going to be that continuation of the original reboot, and a lot of the characters are coming back. You've got Price, of course, you've got Garrick, you've got Riley, you've got a ton of people coming back for this game. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is going to be set in 2022, three years after Price formed Task Force 141 with the rest of the characters and adding in Vargas as the newest member of the group. So this is gonna happen after a US missile strike kills a foreign general. 141 is gonna be called in to keep the situation under control and stop it from getting worse. And what's a battle if it's not three other groups? You're also gonna be fighting terrorist groups and a drug cartel. But that's not all, they made some big changes to the gunsmith, which allows for you to add the weapon platform, see branching progression, which makes the game a bit less repetitive for upgrades. They have done a tremendous amount of work on this to really, I think, step forward Call of Duty into something that is a bit more advanced and certainly does feel a bit more technologically adequate when it comes to other titles, especially in the AI. That's one of the big places. Some people are playing the beta right now and it seems like they're enjoying it, but I am gonna be waiting with bated breath for this one because I hope is going to be good. The next one was a big surprise for me, and that's Dakar Desert Rally. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this isn't just a desert rally, even though that's the name. This is the world's largest off-road rally racing experience ever. Probably not as big as fuel, but we'll have to see. You experience the speed and thrill of the world's largest rally event, including a wide range of all the vehicles. That's motorbikes, automobiles, trucks, quads, and SSVs. And all those vehicles can pretty much go anywhere in those particular stages all throughout this vast open landscape. And it doesn't confine you to the tracks or the roads themselves. That's one of the best things about a true rally game. This is not the same as a lot of rally games where you're just going point to point on a road. It's got four different seasons and complete day night cycles in it. Now you have to go through all of these locations, but it's not just the desert. As I said, there's going to be sandstorms, desert sunshine, rain, snow, and of course, mud, something that I think a lot of times when you think of Dakar, you start to forget that they do go through a lot of different locations in some of these races and stages. This is going to be fantastic. I'm a huge fan of this. And you can see already that they've got a full, complete navigation system in here, various different difficulty settings that you can run on to see if you want to jump in for something casual or jump in for something that's incredibly hardcore. It's got single player and online modes. I mean, what's a little whiplash between friends, right? I cannot wait to play this. I love these kind of games. There's something relaxing and zen about them. And maybe you want to level up from your SnowRunner days. This might be the game for you. That comes out October 4th. The next game is Dragon Ball The Breakers. This interests me. It's a one versus seven online asymmetrical action game. So this is where a group of ordinary people end up attempting to survive the Raider, which is one of the classic Dragon Ball characters, and that character will be hunting them down as the main characters try to survive and get out of this location. There's a temporal seam after being caught up in it. You and the Raider are stuck in a location and all trying to escape. Now, there's a beta for this, and I've heard some positives and negatives about it. You cooperate with the other people on your team, but the Raiders and the other survivors can actually end up going off on their own as well. So if you don't want to escape with the other group, you can do that too. You can work on your own. You can play as the Raider, which gets specific distinct skills and talents for themselves, as well as the players getting their own abilities, skins, equipment to fine tune the exact way in which you want to play as either the survivor or the Raider. There's vehicles, there's guns, capsules, all the gimmicks that you would expect from a Dragon Ball game are in here. This really does break it away from the typical Dragon Ball fare that I've expected from a lot of their titles. So I'm interested to see what it is. If you've been playing this and checking out the beta, tell me what you think in the comments, if it's exciting or if you like it at all. The next one, Plague Tale Requiem. 
So as we know, Plague Tale Requiem, it's an upcoming action adventure game. This is by Focus, who's publishing it and developed by Asobo. This is the sequel to Plague Tale that came out in 2019. It's Amicia and Hugo as they are trying to find a fix for Hugo's blood sickness that we saw in the original game. So they travel to southern France, and this is really a unique place. You can see it in my preview. Requiem, like its predecessor, is going to be that action adventure stealth game played in third person. In the game, the player takes control of Amicia, and you have to battle the different French Inquisition soldiers, swarms of rats, spread in the Black Plague, and work through all of these locations like AI puzzles. The developer didn't want to make people feel like they were thrown for a complete loop, so a lot of the gameplay is the same, but they've greatly enlarged the locations as well as your ability to control the rats, something that the technology has allowed them to do. Amicia is also armed with different weapons now, and she can fight a little bit better. She has a dagger for slashing people, slings for throwing boulders, crossbows for shooting people, and you will work through those in the boss battles and try to figure out exactly how to take out the enemy. It also features a new addition, which is called Tar, and this it basically expands light sources and it's used to actually light foes on fire in addition to all the stuff that you've actually had. But it's not all just you. Sometimes you take over as Hugo who has that ability to control the plague rats and take them on, kill enemies. There is a huge change to the way some of this game plays. Some of it I can talk about, some of it I can't. The game also has more progression than the original title and I think it's going to be incredibly good from what I've seen in the previews, the way this game plays out looks to be phenomenal. One thing to remember is because of these larger locations and because of the way the AI works and the new techniques that you have as both of these characters, it'd be interesting to see if it feels a little too spread out or if they've actually made sure that each location feels like it's still that mind puzzle that the original had. What I've played did seem like that. Next up, Gotham Knights. Yeah, I'm interested in this. This is that action role-playing game. This is going to be by Warner Brothers and developed by Warner Brothers Games Montreal and looks to currently be scheduled for October 21st. We're just going to all hope that. You got Nightwing, Batgirl, Robin, and Red Hood. They're the four playable characters in the game. Each character has distinct play sets, a set of skills. Robin's got the ability to teleport via the Justice League satellite. We've seen that in videos. And this game can be played alone, but it also has a lot of focus on two-player, multiplayer co-op kind of feel to it. The second player can drop in and out at any time without impacting the original player, and you can go anywhere in the game world at any time without getting any kind of extended borders or anything that really restricts your movement. Players can level up your characters. Adversaries also level up as well. You can drive around the city. The game takes place in Gotham City, and this is actually following along with Bruce. Bruce Wayne dying. But even more so, James Gordon's dead. And so what's happened is Gotham City has exploded in just a credible amount of crime. And the developers have even released a villains trailer that shows you all the different villains you're going to be fighting in this game. The trailers that we've seen have both looked excellent and it's sometimes very janky. It's a really difficult title to get a hold of mentally when you see some of these trailers. I'm still holding out hope for it. What I've seen of it does look like it could be very fun, but it has an incredibly difficult trek in front of it, and that is going up against what some people consider to be some of the best superhero games ever, which are the Batman titles. So this is a title I'm looking out for, and I definitely want to see running. I definitely want to jump into, but just a little bit tenuous on just how it's going to turn out. The next one up, Mario Rabbid Sparks of Hope. So Sparks of Hope, this is a turn-based strategy adventure game for the Nintendo Switch. This is done by uh, Ubisoft Milan, Ubisoft Paris, and published by Ubisoft. This is coming out October 20th. Curse has been spreading darkness, seeking out the energy of the Sparks. Mario and the companions have to travel around these worlds to restore galaxy peace. You got to preserve the Sparks. You got to destroy the character and her henchmen. New different characters are also going to jump in, including Bowser, which is very cool. Now, Spark of Hope, they've said it, the gameplay is similar to Kingdom Battle, but there are some switches. I want to talk about this. Players can choose from your nine possible characters. You got characters you expect. You got Donkey Kong, you got Rabbids, you got Mario, Princess Peach, and so on. But there's going to be some new ones here coming along as well. Unlike the first game, the level designs are less linear and the turn-based tactical combat here, it utilizes this new system that disregards the grid-based architecture of the first game. Now, I was a little bit worried about this, but I've seen some of the gameplay footage for it and I sort of see what they're going for. Enemy interactions also that are outside of the turn-based combat can occur. What I did like here is they've actually also added some real-time elements to the game that you can see in some of the trailers. We're just going to have to see how all this worked. 
when you take a title like this that was so beloved for the way it played, it's one of my favorite games of all time, and that turn-based, and you sort of go away from it, you do end up running into this very difficult feeling of how do you not alienate your original gamers and how do you bring everybody else in and embrace new gamers as well. I think that they've done a good job. They've added a little bit more action to it. We'll see how it plays out, but personally, not too worried about this one. It looks like those changes they've really thought about, and it's just going to be a wider, more open, more fluid game. Next up, we got new Tales from the Borderlands. Now, there isn't a great deal about this game that I can talk about without spoiling some stuff, as well as there isn't just that much actual information about the game so far. Gearbox Studio Quebec's doing it, and this is a Borderlands spinoff and the successor to Tales from the Borderlands, so if you played those games, you'll sort of know exactly what you're getting. It is a Tales kind of title, which is that... Walk around, point and click, story, narrative based game. The trio has to work together in this story to get a vault key, which will allow them entrance to a vault containing treasures that's basically gonna, well, fix their lives forever, supposedly. I don't mind the Tales games. Sometimes they're very good. It really depends on their fiction. And I know a ton of people out there are Borderlands fans. And this one looks like they're aiming right down the middle to deliver the same exact kind of experience that they did in the original games. We'll just have to see if they did that because I know a lot of people liked those original titles. And that's coming out here very soon. Now, the next up is Scorn. So Scorn's a different one. I got to play that for a preview. It's supposedly a haunting first-person horror adventure game set in a nightmare environment of strange creatures and dismal tapestries. That's what they say on Steam. They wanted a game that was based on being flung into a unique world. So you're there alone. There's no talking. It's very kind of laid back music. You explore all of these interconnected zones in a nonlinear method, meaning that multiple people can finish some of these puzzles in multiple ways. And I love that. And I did enjoy some of the, what I saw of that in my preview time. There's this feeling of you being absolutely alone and everything's got that Geiger kind of style when it comes to the grotesqueness of the world. That bioengineered human punk kind of feel to everything. And the idea that different ways to finish the puzzles can get you different rewards is very cool. And I did see that in that preview and that really did grab me as a title. However, this is one of those games that it is going out there to be a very lean presentation almost no music at all other than just some sinister sound effects that are very low and layered no voice at all this is a game that is entirely environmental storytelling and the preview i got to play did grab me in some ways but it really did make me wonder if they were going to be able to hold this up for a long deal of gameplay interaction with the world is very realistic though items you pick up with your hands you can move them around you can adjust the machinery with your hands and you get to see all of those impacts on the game world as you play if you like these kind of games slow burn kind of horror games this one may be for you we're just going to have to see how the entire game plays out versus a smaller snippet which is unfortunately what a lot of us got to play but I'm still very much looking forward to it because I like these kind of games that go out there and they give you that lean presentation. And any kind of game that's pushing environmental storytelling is top on my list. Next up, Bayonetta 3. The return of Bayonetta. She returns. She battles numerous foes with a combination of physical strikes and gunplay and some sexiness. The Demon Slave and Demon Masquerade mechanics are brand new to this title, with the former differing from the Climax Summon and the Uberon Climax features in the first two titles by allowing players to take direct control of one of Bayonetta's Infernal Demons to perform different attacks and special abilities. Some of these are going to be advantageous to specific scenarios and demons and characters you're fighting. And I like this idea of some of these puzzles being in the action as you play. We're just going to have to see how Bayonetta wraps up. A lot of people just think of Bayonetta as a sexy kind of action, well, I guess it is, sexy kind of action adventure title, and it is that, but it also has really good combat. This is Platinum, they know what they're doing, and they deliver time and time again when it comes to excellent action. They've had a couple misses, but I think with Bayonetta 3, we're going to see something that looks, to me at least, to be over the top, and really at the same time targeted right at the heart of fans of Bayonetta 1 and 2. And speaking of 2, I'm going to add this one in here just because. Overwatch 2. Yes, I get it. Overwatch 1 is going away. Overwatch 2.0 or whatever you want to call it is coming back. A hero shooter. They've dropped it down to 5v5 instead of 6v6. You got 30 characters. This is coming out. It is a free-to-play game, but I do want to load this up 
as a title that I am actually interested in following and seeing how it sort of comes to fruition. This is a title that has had a lot of back and forth about it since it was originally announced. There was a lot of things going away and a lot of decisions that I think a lot of people didn't really understand where Blizzard was going with this. I want to see how this comes out and really how it ends up working out. There's been a lot of changes, including developers changing and leaving, art designers changing and leaving, but I'm still interested to see how they're going to do this. A lot of games that go to a sequel don't turn off the original game. They usually leave it running, whether that be Division or some other title. This is one of those titles that's directly just jumping to Overwatch 2. I believe they're turning Overwatch 1 off maybe two days prior. I could be wrong on that. And so what we're going to see is Overwatch to really replacing the entire game and changing the way a lot of things are going to feel. A lot of people are going to step into this and almost feel like they're new players, even if they're not. So that ability to see how this is all going to work out is very interesting to me. Even if it turns out bad, I want to talk about it because I think it is a title that is going to, at the very least, inform a lot of developers how to do this if they do want to jump from their original title to a sequel or even how Blizzard is going to continue business moving forward if they find out that Overwatch 2 didn't really uh, bake their clams like they were hoping. Bake their clams. I haven't used that in a long time. If you guys have any games that you guys want to add, throw them in the list. Throw them in the comments. I'd like to know what titles you guys think. Do you guys want any of these titles I've talked about? Or are you worried about it? Feel free to put that in the comments as well. I think when you look at these titles, October is jammed. There's uh, other games I didn't even mention, like a Star Ocean game and a couple others. So it's not like October doesn't have a lot of games. And this is ramping up to a fall and into next year that is friggin' incredible. You know what else is incredible? The Discord. I'm going to push it. The Discord is awesome. I've had multiple people coming in, and because of the channel getting demonetized all the time, you guys have jumped in and really helped keep the channel going. I love it. So if I've saved you any money, or if I've warned you away from a crappy game, come in. We got the Discord, people role-playing, people streaming video games, people talking about games, teaming up. We have our own creation places where if you have a video that you want other people to see and maybe help you with, get better. If you want to start streaming or making videos, we even have a channel for that. It is an amazing group and just a phenomenal place to be. And it helps out the channel. Stay tuned here. You're going to see some previews, more AI reviews, and a ton of other stuff. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.